So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Advisors Webinar Surviving the Pandemic. Tonight, uh, uh, I would like to ask our speaker, uh, Saeed Mubarak, can you please turn on your uh, video and audio? Good evening, Saeed. Good evening, Doctor. How, how are you, my dear, tonight? Good? Alhamdulillah, yeah, good. Okay, I'd like to welcome you from Eastern Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saeed is joining us tonight to speak about key ingredients for the successful digitalization projects. So, uh, to start quickly, uh, we passed the five, and who is actually Saeed? Um, let me just move us a bit, okay? So Saeed, he's an experienced uh, professional with over 20 plus years of experience. Uh, originally, he's a chemical engineer, he's a process engineer, uh, and he is the chairman of SPE, SPE is the Society of Petroleum engineers for the digital energy technical section. He is a multiple award winner, he's a writer, he has a book, he is a speaker and industry advisor. His profession, he's been working uh, for Aranco for the past uh, 16 plus years. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I'm Said. multiplied by two. Okay, 32 it's years. It's about 30. <laughs> about 30, 30 years, okay. He has multiple uh, roles uh, uh, in Aramco. So, uh, and one of these has to do with digitalization. Uh, having said that, I'd like to give you the wheels and for you to, to start uh, the session the way you like. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sali. And since we're talking about projects, uh, the advisors uh, endeavor, this endeavor is a project by itself and uh, it takes leadership and people who are really invisible to, to make it a success. Thank you very much, Dr. Saadi, for it. And definitely uh, the appreciation goes to those hidden soldiers, especially Mustafa Al-Kurdi. Uh, he's here, I'm, I'm sure he's watching us and taking care of us without anybody knowing who Mustafa is. So thank you very much, Mustafa. Thank you, my dear. On my behalf, Mustafa and the rest of the team. Yes, Mustafa is the soldier be behind us all. <laughs> uh, well, when uh, whenever you see these uh, slides, basically, uh, on digitalization or projects, you would see people, technologies, and processes. Uh, but uh, let me start with the disclaimer. Uh, over here, I'll be discussing uh, ideas, concepts. They will be educational. I hope they will be entertaining and exploratory for uh, some of the ones who uh, haven't been involved with the petroleum engineering. All the ideas are mine. So uh, basically, I'm not really representing SPE or the company that I work for. Uh, so that's all my, my ideas and the discussion is, is basically within uh, my expertise. Key ingredients for uh, successful digitalization projects. Uh, digitalization projects is just like any any project. And uh, you see the triangle here. It's people, technologies, and processes. Uh, and we'll start with, this is different from controlling, by the way, a PowerPoint slide. It's a, it's a different uh, system. Uh, well, we'll start with important tips. and. Same ingredients, since we're talking about ingredients of projects, do not have to produce same results. And I'm sure everyone knows uh, that, especially those who uh, help uh, in, in basically cooking. Uh, technologies are usually targeted as fit for purpose uh, technologies. So they're not really, uh, companies don't really seek technologies for the sake of implementation technologies. They seek values out of these technologies to solve a certain challenge. So they must be aware of all the challenges and, uh, and the value that it, it, it is basically the, these technologies are intended for. Technologies are different. Um, definitely, there is no one size fits all because environments of application of these technologies, people and management and organizations are a bit different. And definitely these technologies 
uh, would fit in certain areas where basically um, they're designed for. For every technology, there are capabilities, but definitely there are uncertainties that come with them. And uh, this requires some sort of expertise, knowledge about the environment that these technology will be implemented in, uh, and now understanding their capabilities and the uncertainties associated with them. And an implementation of any technology, one would be focusing in not only the short term, uh, because they have to be aligned with the long term uh, objective of uh, and the overriding objective of the organization, uh, the company or even a country. So there might be a focus on and an act locally and think globally. That's what basically uh, one should think uh, of. So act locally, think globally. Now we're starting basically with a poll just to gauge uh, the audience uh, who I wish I, I could see, uh, but that's a technology limitation here. Uh, or the poll, what industries are leading digital transformation? Is it energy, retail, financial logistics, manufacturing and automotive, healthcare, or education? And I'll give you just a few seconds here to, to go through these. Well, it's already stabilized anyway. So you could see manufacturing and automotive, and uh, basically retail, finance, and logistics, and maybe they're the really highest. Well, energy is getting into the, it's competing. Well, that's based on the knowledge of the audience anyway. So, but let me share with you uh, the same poll that I shared with expertise in uh, artificial intelligence, technology implementation, and digital, digital transformation. Uh, so retail, financial, and logistics domain uh, basically based on another survey, uh, maybe taking the leading, uh, you know, role in digitalization, digital transformation. So we would see digital transformation more, uh, you know, uh, present and, and retail, finance and logistics. It's not only today, but it's, it's been this way because it's, it's more born uh, with technologies. Uh, that doesn't mean... Uh, digital transformation is not in the other domains, uh, including healthcare, manufacturing, and, and energy. Now, energy is my domain, and uh, digital oil fields is more of uh, a hobby to me. And But it's just like, it's not only that. When you look at uh, majors and their views on digital transformation or digital oil fields and there are different names of them intelligent fields most of the majors indicate that the digital transformation brings value some of them translated it into tangible value where basically you see billions some of them translated it into intangible of improvement of hse improvement of processes and the business environment but definitely all the assessment and study indicate that any digital transformation that is established on basis brings value. Now, what value uh, to that digital transformation brings to the uh, petroleum industry? Well, there are several objectives when it comes to every single company, be it national oil uh, company or international uh, operating company. Uh, but definitely you will see more emphasis in one of these objectives that you see them in the leaves here. It's either maximizing oil recovery, and this is more of a long-term objectives, and you will see that more, the more emphasis on maximum, maximizing oil recovery on national oil companies. Uh, you will be seeing them or hearing them talking about energy for generation, and they want to extend the life of the fields. And uh, this basically uh, considers the technologies that they implement, the way they manage their fields, and the way they even operate their fields and operate their uh, projects. And but other other companies are maybe optimizing cost, and that's more of a reduction. It, it depends on. On, the, uh, on their focus. National oil companies who are investing, let's say, in a field that's a smaller field, 
uh, and a plan is maybe to sell, uh, to produce it at a higher rate, then maybe sell it. Uh, it's a bit different from maximizing recovery because their objectives are different. And definitely all of them, they would like to enable sustainability. Uh, Saeed, uh, just one thing, if I can uh, interrupt you a bit. Whatever you're talking about in terms of digitalization for the oil and gas industry, it can apply to other industries, or is it specific for the oil and gas industry? Well, it's the same model, it's the same philosophy. Uh, if you go even to the medical industry, uh, it has processes, technologies, and definitely the business environment itself that can compensate selecting the, te the right technology for the processes within that industry. So over here, uh, we're talking maybe over uh, about the petroleum industry, but in reality, just say industry X. It's about the same. They want to maximize the value of the implementation of technology using the existing processes or maybe modifying these processes to accommodate the changes that technology bring or maybe uh, other basically... Uh, uh, let's say optimization procedures or standards that are new. So it's the same. We're talking about technologies and processes and people. I mean, Thank you. Even, even advisors themselves, now we're talking about process here. I'm, I'm sure you go through a process of uh, vetting the uh, presentation, selecting the people uh, to present, and using this technology is just like a, a webinar jam. I'm sure you went through assessment of many technologies and you see Webinar Jam as maybe better for the service that you would like. It doesn't mean exactly. there is no Zoom that works. There is yes. uh, Microsoft Teams, but it's a fit for purpose. And I'm sure you've done the same exercise uh, that, you know, I listed a few tips, but I'm sure you, you basically went through all the tips to select Webinar Jam for a specific objective. Okay, thank you. Th sorry for the interruption. No, 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 it's, it's okay. Uh, now, what does it really take uh, for a project to be successful or at least to move forward in, in, in a certain vision? And there is more of a video here that will demonstrate three different types of uh, mentality or mindsets uh, when a, a project or a challenge comes by. So over here, you would see uh, more of symbolic uh, three individuals. This is more of a pessimist. Uh, he faces a challenge, there is a project and objectives. Definitely there are some sort of plans and execution, uh, but, uh, well, he's a pessimist, so uh, I'd rather just not go and uh, face this challenge. I'll, I'll just wait for someone else to, uh, to make it. So a, a pragmatic comes and calculates basically the, cha you know, the, uh, the risk, and it seems to be too risky for, for him as well, so he stays. No, there is a one that comes, but with two, two basically attributes. He has a vision, he, uh, one that sees the future, and a power. So he executes a plan. <whistles> Think about a plan, execute it, and move. But, but definitely when they move, they don't move by themselves. They bring their teams with them. And in fact, the rest of the companies <laughs> now move forward, but they will be considered as laggers, but, and they would need another one to do about the same thing. Again, they'll continue staying, waiting for someone uh, to basically overcome a new challenge, and they wouldn't believe that they even moved. Well, it's very simple cartoon, but it, it says a lot. Uh, that's the present and, and basically uh, future, and this is basically what, what comes We need to go back to the, uh, the slides. This is basically what comes with, uh, with any project and uh, uh, be it within the oil industry and other projects, if, if there is some sort of a futuristic thing uh, that involves a risk or a challenge, uh, definitely uh, there has to be some sort of power and, and vision and it's only those who have the power and vision who will move forward and, and may basically create a path for others to, to follow. Uh, now, this is a second poll where basically 
what is the main enabler for digitalization uh, projects uh, and even other any other project are they enabling technology especially the IT related uh, projects or business models uh, talent and culture and including basically uh, those who have power and and vision uh, leadership and that's basically people you can see that number four is basically the choice of the majority and it's more of uh, people uh, or leadership and when it comes to leadership uh, it's basically it's not only it's a mindset rather than a position so it's people who have thoughts they are leaders people who see the future they're leaders people with power basically they're supporters of those who have thoughts and and, and visions and if you basically look at the uh, you're almost consistent uh, with the previous vote that I, uh, it's about the same number of uh, people who participated and at the same time, uh, they're saying about the same. So you see leadership is a key to the success of any digitalization project. They're the enablers. In fact, they're the ones, uh, uh, they're the ones who are making decisions. They're the ones who are making decisions about the technologies. The, they're the ones making the business environment. They're the ones selecting optimization processes and making the best out of them, be, be it selecting existing one or creating new ones. So if you look at this slide, if this slide it shows basically multiple spheres. Every sphere is associated with the adjacent uh, enabler. So when it comes to enabling technologies, they're the biggest sphere. They're really expensive. The sphere is the investment size uh, for an existing organization. Business environment, that's a, a smaller sphere. That's a, a smaller you know, investment size. But when it comes to people, you have your own people. Uh, and basically, the investment size is, is the smallest. But if you look at it from a different uh, perspective, the value really comes from people, if you look at the X uh, axis, basically value, the highest value comes out of people, including workers, including engineers, including consultants, including leaders and, and thought leaders. People are the ones who are inventing technologies. They're the ones uh, examining all the challenges within a project, within uh, a field, within uh, a sector. Uh, they're the ones thinking of how change management is done within the environment uh, and they're the ones creating also the processes. So when it goes to all the other uh, enablers, in fact, they're influenced, invented or changed by people. Now, the irony is with people is you will see just like the uh, the cartoon that we've seen uh, we've seen earlier is uh, who moves there are the futuristic ones and you would see few people can be uh, mentioned as more of the innovators, people who you admire for the changes they were able to do, be it in a society and in introducing a technology, introducing theories and science. And you could see here of nine people that I'm sure you know at least few of them. Uh, they were pioneers, they had the courage, they had the money, they had the power. It doesn't have to be not then money. It's the mental, mental power that drive them to, to do a change or to introduce a change. Now, the irony with the human uh, the, that you have people who are driving change, but still, they're the ones who resist change. And this is really an irony. They want to change. And if you ask anyone, it's just like this is a cartoon that you would see in, in many of the uh, magazines and uh, you know um, jokes that we make about people and management and, 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 and society change. Who wants to change? Everybody wants change. But if you ask them who wants to change, then it's really hard, uh, be it within uh, a community, be it being a, a nation, or be it within a company. So this is the hardest thing that people manage when it comes to uh, the uh, change management thing. And, and uh, change management might be, might be a, a specialty by itself within an organization uh, for project management, for introducing new technologies, uh, definitely there has to be someone who uh, basically study the gaps, uh, sees where the company wants to go, where they are, uh, to formulate a plan that basically, uh, you know, is aligned with the strategy, at the same time considers the values and the mindsets of existing mentality. Now, 
Another point before we go into more deeper discussion, who or what is the main driver for digital transfer transformation in your company, in your domain? Is it leaders, evangelists, bottom up, uh, core business and operation value? So if you if you see that this process and technology brings value, then it's the driver. Our crisis, just like COVID-19, and um, you've seen some of the uh, yeah, the uh, you know videos that were in the introductory part. Uh, this basically advisors and the free webinars are more of uh, were born of this pandemic thing. And uh, uh, so sometimes crises crises give birth to certain programs that did not even exist, and they bring value. Uh, but crises are not really permanent. They're uh, some some of them are not even expected. So. And if, if you look at the, the poll here, and uh, they focus on the top uh, leaders and the bottom crisis, they're more of the drivers for change. I think it's stabilized and it's, it's, it's leaders and uh, mostly leaders. There is no right or wrong answer because uh, maybe at a certain time, Crisis can drive and expedite change, just like what's happening today and these times and with the crisis of COVID-19. But there is someone who would come basically and state, oh, necessity is the mother of invention. Okay, I mean, it's it's fine. It's a it's good thing. And there are inventors who uh, identify uh, and explore for uh, solutions for challenges just like now you will see multiple people talking about platforms to communicate and discuss the digital and the availability of the uh, the net the the high speed communication uh, facilitated all of these uh, means to communicate and give let's say presentation now conduct meetings virtually but someone would come and say waiting for an, an uh, a necessity it's just like uh, it's not really uh, for visionaries. Visionaries would see what's needed in the future and they plan for it. So, in fact, it's uh, it might be seen as a deficiency. If you if a necessity is a mother of invention, even if they come up with a certain solution, they're not really the visionaries who design solutions for some sort of expected. Uh, I wouldn't say crisis changes. Uh, and, and, and norms, uh, but definitely leaders can be the top, top basically a driver for uh, for change. Uh, and there are examples of many changes in the world, and even countries, uh, or even in habits of uh, societies that were uh, basically driven by a leader decision or a leader strategy. No, it's about the same. Uh, this is an, a previous poll. It's just to share with you what others from different societies and a focus on digital transformation stated. So definitely, I, I think there is uh, a match in them. Now, we talk about evolutions, and evolutions, uh, they're almost everywhere when it comes to technologies. And when it comes to, let's say, electronics and devices, uh, it might be even exponential. Uh, if you look at this gra uh, graph, basically, uh, you see in the top left, a wooden box, and that's a, a computer. Now you go bottom, you see a device that's in your hand, but it's a computer, it's a telephone, uh, it's a camera, and it's, it's, it could be, it, it holds within, uh, within it many of the digi digital transformation means including AI-based solutions, machine learning, so they learn even how you act and behave, and they may uh, monitor you and monitor your activities, just like how, how many steps you do. So it's a system that's very advanced, but through evolution, we reach this. And it's the cumulative knowledge and efforts of many people, and some of them don't know each other. They just built on the knowledge of others and they invested in them 
And this is why societies and, and even projects advance. And advisors is, is one of the platforms that makes us think and accumulate more knowledge from different parts of the world. And this is, you know, uh, again, it's a, it's a great appreciation to Dr. Saadi for taking the initiative and, and, and leading it. Now you go to the uh, uh, industries. Uh, we heard about uh, the first industrial revolution, the second and the third and the fourth. And you will see more emphasis in the fourth, especially today with the fast communication, uh, power, uh, computing power, and, and uh, cheap memories. And, uh, and now with the algorithms and, uh, and, and basically the, the AI coming in the game. And you see more emphasis uh, on AI and machine learning and, uh, uh, and the potential impact that it can bring to industries. All the industries, in fact, is not limited to the petroleum, to, the, to all the sectors. Inclu including project management. Now, if you look at it, is it really evolution or it is just like a natural growth of things because people just invest uh, and invent things, use them, learn from them, and build on the experience of others. Uh, but definitely there are times where certain technology plays a major shift of norms just like introducing the internet into the public after it was more of a military uh, you know, tool. You see how people changed. Uh, you see industries uh, disappeared. It's just like now with emails, it's, it's rarely you see someone send uh, a post letter. Although I appreciate post letters, but still because they have their uh, you know, value, but maybe the young generation would, uh, maybe the new ones, the, the young generation don't even send posts. Uh, they just capitalize on emails and texting. So th they change even the culture and how we live. Now, if you go to the petroleum industry, and this is more of, uh, uh, you know, this is my hobby now. And this is the domain that I know more about. And definitely, I, all I know through this 30 years, I discovered that I, all I know is uh, very little. But I'll share with you part of this tiny uh, fit that accumulated through this 30 years. Now, if you look at the pictures in the top, uh, you will see rigs. And rigs are basically uh, uh, used to drill wells. Uh, and the first one is more of a wooden uh, with this little steel. But then you see in the right, there are two rigs, drilling rigs, and they're offshore. And now they have automated uh, uh, rigs. Now, this is the surface that people see. But if you go subsurface, and this is the bottom uh, picture through the 1950s, they have only vertical holes, maybe very shallow for water, then uh, shallow oil reservoirs. Then they go deeper and deeper, then they go horizontal, then they go multilateral walls. And I'm, I'm bringing this because I'll bring you an example uh, about optimization of a multilateral well, which is a project by itself. Now, you could see the complexity. These wells go two kilometers below the ground. And some of them extend to even five kilometers and more. So they call them maximum reservoir contact, extended reach, and, and others. They are not only symbol holes in the ground. They install equipment and technologies to control the flow from the ground, flow of oil, hydrocarbon, gas, and definitely there will be water and other components. Now, this is more of sci-fi to some of the uh, people who are not really aware of what the petroleum engineering are doing, but let's go now a little bit deeper with components in the system that might be relevant to many of the participants. Now, the picture in the left, over the top left, is just to show you more of a, uh, you know, an artistic view of the, of the rig itself and the well inside the reservoir that penetrates formation. And there are three laterals, so three branches, just like the roots of the tree. Now, at surface, you will have a technology 
that but they're different uh, sort of technologies. You will see surface instrumentations, automated valves, multi-phase flow meters to measure the flow, the rate, chokes to reduce basically the flow or to control it or to even shut in the web and other valves. You will see downhole gauges and that's the BDGMS basically permanent, permanent downhole gauges uh, at, at the bottom of the reservoir. You could see artificial lift systems, they call them ESPs and with sensors and technologies and, and basically, uh, you know, uh, and many other tools within it. And you will see also smart wells. All of these are connected to the surface to instrumentations, including communication infrastructure, IT infrastructure, be it RTU, RTUs, multiplexers, and uh, definitely they, they have to be electrified uh, through a means of electricity uh, generation. The whole thing, it's not a single well. So the branches goes to a well in the surface, then it goes to a plant to be to to have these fluids processed and treated, and the data goes into the IT infrastructure, to control rooms and maybe to the headquarter to engineers who to manage basically the whole reservoir. It's not only a single well; it's multiple wells. Sometimes they focus locally, not only in a well in a lateral subsurface in a well how much it's to produce, to manage the production. Should we do the similar thing in the other lateral? What do we do with the well? So they focus and act locally, but in their mind, they think globally, not in the well itself because it has multiple branches, but they have multiple wells. So when it comes to any optimization, they're not thinking of only one single well. They're thinking of multiple wells. It's not only the production, it's the data that is transferred from the well and the sensors into the IT infrastructure to the desktop. It's the accuracy of the data, the reliability of the data, the analysis of the data, and what exactly they do with this data for the ultimate objective to produce. So there are multiple objectives within. It's a, a very complex, more of equation that has multiple and variable objectives that they can change with time. Now, I'll give you just one example I'll, on a well. Let's go focus in one well. This is a trilateral well, which means it has three branches. Branch one, two, and three. I mean, or they call them motherboard. This is the one, uh, you know, the deepest part. Then the branches are called branches, basically, or uh, uh, laterals. One and two, and maybe three and four. You have... Within this lateral, which is inside the ground, maybe two kilometer, three kilometer within the ground, even five kilometer subsurface, you have valves for every single lateral. So you can shut one or shut two, shut in two, or maybe close all of them, close one of them, or control uh, basically the flow from each one of them to to fulfill your objective from that factory. It's, a, it's, it's basically, uh, it's a factory. It's, it's a will, consider it as a factory or consider every lateral as a highway and they all, all merge into one bigger highway. And in every single lateral, you have cars, you have motorcycles and you have trucks. And it depends on your objective. You wanna give away to cars. Maybe this is oil. You don't want to give more weight or more away to trucks. Maybe water. I don't want to produce water. I just want to produce oil. And I, want to, I don't want to produce gas. So let's say this is a highway and this is an optimization, uh, basically, uh, method that you, you come up with or you create to make sure you meet your objective uh, within uh, to produce this well, the objective of the well at a certain time, and objectives can change with time. For the infrastructure that is subsurface, you need surface equipment. One of them is surface hydraulic system, which is used to control the subsurface valves. You need a multi-phase flow meter to measure the rate and the flow that's coming from the well 
at the surface. You need RTUs, a SCADA system. And if you look at this ICV, these are the valves that are installed subsurface. And you could see them as a sliding sleeve. One of them is closed and one of them is open. So you, you open it or you close it. And uh, it basically, it gives you, if you open it, it's a higher flow area uh, uh, that's basically accessible by the fluid. And BDHMS is a device to measure pressure and temperature across every single valve. Now, more than this, so you have the left basically picture. It shows how the completion is with its valves and the branches. So the flow goes from the branches into the completion. The Basically, the completion, you see the steel uh, structure there. Now, every single lateral is basically uh, described here as a box. And this box has its own attributes. So it has different pressure from the other box. So branch one is different from branch two, is different from branch three. It has different power, different pressure. It has different uh, fluids. Maybe it could be different portions of gas and oil and water. And you have also the valve itself that has different choke settings that you can control. The environment at subsurface and the nature of the nature you can't change. You cannot change nature, but you can at least control the valve to be able to more of induce some sort of action on nature itself uh, to make it more of uh, meet your uh, ultimate objective. Now, you someone if he sees all the variables it can be very complex but there has to be some sort of uh, uh, a model uh, to this world with all these variables to be uh, able to optimize the production of the world now let let me show you but first a movie or a clip that's more of uh, 50 seconds to describe to you the concept of uh, multilateral worlds what uh, associated with the intelligent fields, uh, Dr. Sadi? A smart well is just like a root of a tree. If the tree has more roots, it has more chances to get more water. So we go and create our own roots, and these are the multilateral wells that goes and branches two kilometers below the ground. And we give every branch a sensing capability plus a control capability so we know where the fluids are coming and what kind of fluids from each branch. When we connect these smart wells together using fiber optics, we then have access to vast amount of real-time data to make faster and smarter decisions and maximize oil and gas recovery. These interconnected smart wells are known as intelligent fields. So at least that gives you more of a description on a simplified description of what a smart world, a multilateral world, and the intelligent fields. Now, let's see and act locally in one example of these smart worlds and how we do the optimization. This is an actual well that you can refer to in one of the uh, publications uh, by SPE. And if you look at it, you have lateral A, B, and C. And each lateral has a valve. And if you consider the colored uh, valve, basically a colored circle there, it means a closed valve. And if you look at the uh, open, it's basically non uncolored, basically circle. Now, we have to test every lateral and see what kind of production from that, the, that lateral. Is it oil? Is it gas? Is it, is it only water? And the objective was clear. It was to produce oil, only oil from this. And we know that the area, at least we knew at that time, that the area had uh, low pressure. So if we produce water, the, uh, the well will, in, be, will be incapable of producing and basically the, uh, the, the fluids because of the low pressure and the heavy, uh, basically the load that water brings with. Uh, so it cannot really lift a column of water, but it can lift a column of oil 
uh, it's lighter. Now, what we've done is basically we decided to go and test every single lateral by itself to see how much of a production it, it can give to us and to decide what kind of settings of the subsurface valves uh, for every single lateral. And, and let's go basically on this. So we tested lateral A, half open. You see at the red circle uh, is half, basically, 50% uh, 50, uh, 50 colored. The other ones are closed, the blue and yellow. And it produces the column in the left and the right, sorry. Uh, it shows how much of production it, uh, it, it gave, and it produces only water, blue. And this is undesired fluid. We don't want water, but at least we know where water is coming from. Now, we tested the other lateral, which is B, partially open, and it produced green. I mean, if you look at the columns, green, it's only oil. And this is something, you know, of a great favor to us. This is great. And we, we know that P is, B is producing oil. Now, we went to the third lateral, and this is C, 50% open. It produced oil and water. And now, this gives you some sort of Okay, this, that's really intriguing. I mean, how would we optimize this? We have to create a model for the whole infrastructure, including the subsurface infrastructure, but we need to know more data. So that's the process of collecting data to understand the whole environment here. So we tested the same lateral, but at, dif at a different choke settings. So we restricted it. And by restricting it, the reservoir itself, nature, gave us different response and produced only oil. And that's an indication of possible fractured res reservoir. And there is a fracture with a connection. If you introduce some sort of a drawdown, a high drawdown, it invites water. And if you slow down by restricting the valve, then it produces only oil. And we've done several runs and, and tests just to make sure we understand, as, understand the whole environment, not only a single well, a single lateral by itself, but the whole environment. So uh, partially open, uh, closed one, open one, partially open the other one. So multiple ones, multiple uh, settings within these files till we reached a decision after a thorough assessment, analysis of the information that we had in the field. We decided close A, partially open uh, both B and, and C. That was the decision and it produces 6,000 uh, barrels for a long time. And if you go to the paper, it will indicate more details about the infrastructure, the story. I mean, it's, it's a very fascinating story. Now, you could see we, again, focused locally and act locally in A, then B, then C. Then we focused on the whole infrastructure and acted on the analysis and, 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 and the design of the test itself to acquire the information that is required to do the analysis. It was a project, but it's a minute project compared to other projects, but it's the same concept. Get the data, analyze the data, see the objectives of, the, of the, every single lateral, the challenges, plan some sort of a strategy to produce the well. That means the overriding objective of the well, then the whole field, because there are many wells adjacent to this well that have similar issues, or maybe have no issues. So you need to adjust all of them to make sure that you produce the amount that you want from this world and the other worlds to meet certain demand or certain quota. You've seen this in one minute or two, and I explain it fully, but in reality, it took more than two weeks. People in the field, people in the office, executing the, the thing, and operators, the operator themselves with the service company, and all the technology sets that you've seen at the previous slides. So the surface hydraulic system has to be operating. Uh, they have to be in good conditions to make sure that the data that you get is right and appropriate and can be used to do an appropriate analysis to make the right decision. So all of them have to be integrated in one uh, more of a platform with leaders who basically uh, keep engaged. Well, uh, they were engaged, even leaders. They were in the States and they were calling, what's happening uh, with our test? So care. And 
care is very essential to the success of any project. Care and the sense of ownership. And this is a subject that we'll discuss later. Now, that's the principle basically is very simple, but it goes into projects. It goes into decision making. You go acquire the data, do the analysis, make the decision and act. That's more of a normal cycle. Now you will learn more. You will know maybe the, that uh, the decision that you made based on the information that's available is not the best. Then you go into a cycle for gaining more knowledge and gaining more data and experience to make a better analysis, making a better decision and another implementation. Now, there are things that take different time loops. And uh, if you go to an instrumentation and real operation, they, you might need the uh, infrastructure to be aligned with the operation itself. So when it comes to artificial lift system, they're machines just like automating uh, and the uh, just like uh, Formula One. Uh, when it comes to racing, you have to the sensors have to detect in microseconds basically measurements, and and the communication system have to transfer the data quickly enough for the uh, basically the asset owner to make a decision. Uh, banking systems and tiller machines, they have to be really uh, instrumented with a quick system. So let's assume that you have two SIM ca I mean cards, bank cards, and you insert them in two uh, ATM machines at the same time. And if you have, let's say, one $500 and you want to uh, withdraw them, if you're able in a microsecond to do the same execution for the same function, you might get two 500. But in fact, this system is built, so you can't. Now, when it comes to operation of a field and uh, optimization of a will, just like the will we, we showed to you or the example of optimization, it took longer time. So do we really need that fast communication? Uh, that will be assessed by every single company. Are they going to be in site? Are they going to be in the headquarters? Are they going to be remotely controlling the thing or locally controlling the, th the thing? Now, every single process has its own unit, uh, time unit, specific time unit. There are processes that are quick. Then you need to build the whole infrastructure to accommodate that quick decision. It could be minutes. But now, for processes that are really slow or slower, and it's only weeks, uh, it takes weeks to make a decision, then the whole infrastructure, you go back, constructing the thing, CapEx and OpEx will be influenced by the whole. Uh, so technologies, again, it's a fit for purpose. You have to be very uh, you know, aware of what the real objective and the kind of operation. So do, domain knowledge is really important when it comes to this uh, uh, design of the project from A to Z. Now, where are the values coming from? So this is more of an illustration of the path for maximum value. Technologies, they'll bring value, but technologies are just tools. And they're, they're maybe named as uh, smart technologies, but in reality, there isn't an, a smart technology by itself. You embed smartness in it uh, to meet your objective. Uh, knowledge management, every technology and sensor in the digital world produce data and this data has to be transferred into or translated into knowledge and this knowledge has to be managed and uh, uh, become reliable so the, the decisions subsequent decisions are more of uh, produ producers of value to be able to do informed operations and maybe predictive operation and optimization to the whole system or to a single uh, component within a system now if you look at this circle uh, multiple circles here. Full circles indicate maturity. The more mature the technology, the bigger value that you will get. The more mature the knowledge management standards and uh, uh, the visualization, data reliability, and uh, all of these, then uh, you get more value of that thing. But the highest value come from uh, more of the decisions and, in fact, actions. So uh, we go into 
uh, a study uh, done by IBM benchmarking multiple uh, companies and getting their feedback, they saw that most of the value comes from predictive operations and informed operations. So they're the two plus optimization. And optimization, in fact, it's done in all over the project cycle, be it at the beginning, even optimization of the infrastructure itself, construction and time and, and all these things. But predictive operations to prevent things, uh, to optimize, to meet your objectives. So knowing and seeing the future is really a plus. And this would what uh, is brought by numerical simulators and today the artificial and machine learning uh, technologies, all you hear about, I will be able to predict the future for you and predict failures, detect things that happen and to avoid things or to optimize. Now, there are three ingredients for maximum value. The, when it comes to, and this applies in any uh, industry, in any project, be it a digital project or any other construction and others. Organizational structure alignment in the digitalization for digitalization. Uh, but if you remove digitalization projects, then put any project. Comprehension of objectives. People need to be aware what exactly the objectives are. And collective competencies, be it domain experts and technology experts, they have to be more of, uh, there has to be an environment for both of them to work together and uh, to collaborate and you will see what others other things that they need to do now we'll go on the aligning organizational structure for let's say intelligent fields and this is more of basic thing they have to you have to have strategic business architecture work process architecture and technical process architecture not having these or having these will result in fast and great results definitely and the business architecture, basically business, uh, strategic business, it will constitute of vision and mission and a, ro a clear roadmap with the portfolio management. The work process, these are basically the essentials of it, and we'll dig deep into each one of them. So if you go to the uh, strategic elements, mission and strategy have to be really clear. This is to eliminate ambiguity, to have clarity and simplicity for everyone. Executive commitment, it's a high priority action uh, if they're really involved in it. Otherwise, it's just like it's low priority. Management incentives, then it's a talk with action. So it's not a talk with no action. Program portfolio management, and if they know exactly what they're doing, they clear about the objectives, they will put the adequate investment for it. Decision deployment, then it's a full utilization of the whole basically project this architecture, you have to have a process map, work process map, then everything is clear. And improvement, uh, business improvement opportunities are just like clear to everyone. Uh, you have to have matrix and, and KBIs. So you have energy for the business improvement opportunities. Business improvement opportunities, if you have them clear, then it's a focus. Business readiness of process definitely is a higher process uh, success opportunity. Now, you go to the technical architecture and definitely with digitalization, it's more, of, more focus into technologies. And this is why there has to be more of a technical architecture design to have adequate you know, technical performance. And the technological uh, uh, technologies acquisition process, uh, approval process, trial testing process have to be really, really clear. And the process has to be uh, understood by all the stakeholders. And it has to be implemented. System preparation, you will have a high technical performance. Then if you have secure implementation process, everyone will have willingness to implement. Now, when it comes to clarifying business objectives or needs and expectation, ownership, roles and responsibilities, data management, equipment, continuity, and value estimation. Sense of ownership, definitely you need more of awards and recognition. Educate and collaborate 
both teams. Let me bring here advisors here. Definitely there is a sense of ownership. And this is, you see uh, Dr. Saadi in every single webinar or panel discussion. That's, and the award is a certificate for every attendee. And it's full of education uh, on various aspects. And definitely he is collaborating with us. Yesterday he had a call with me just to educate me on how to use this uh, platform. Roles and responsibilities, it was clear. He has a project. It's tailored and maintained. Again, he educated me on my role, uh, when to switch off, when to switch on, and he enforced it. Data management, again, when it comes to the digital oil fields, there has to be a standardized and automated uh, just to make sure that data is trans transferred in a smooth way and becomes reliable for the subsequent decisions. Equipment, if there is an equipment, there is a potential failure. So you have to maintain them. You have to have a strategy that is clear, one to maintain uh, uh, what kind of failures, assessments of workflows, and if they're standardized, then basically, and maybe with the predictive uh, and informed operations, you will be able to do magic in, these, in this uh, equipment. In fact, with AI uh, implementation, let's say artificial lift and introduction of machine learning, you could uh, create uh, a virtual sensing, uh, just like the sensors, you can create uh, a virtual sensor. Now, continuity in any project is a, is a must for, uh, for success. If not, then uh, it's, it's not really prone to failure, but it will slow down. Teams have to be basically engaged, uh, and the members have to be more of... Uh, uh, very collaborative, and they transfer the knowledge. So the uh, the love of transfer knowledge and sharing knowledge and collaboration has to be embedded within their system, mindset system. And definitely there has to be accountability and reporting system, uh, preferably if it's automated. Value estimation. People implement technologies for the sake of creating value. So definitely they know the objective, but they need to aim to create value. Now, again, they have to be clear on the uh, clarifying business needs and expectations. Now, in our industry, in the oil and gas, uh, we have wells. Some of them are 100 years and some of them 50 years. They're really aging. So that's more of a production loss. You ha they have a um, high production rate at the beginning, but now they are less uh, production. Maybe some of them are dead already. You have maturing fields, which means maturing facilities. They need uh, resource incentives, extensive surveillance to make sure they're healthy, they're reliable, they're safe. And now we once you implement even technologies that an incentive, intensive maintenance that's required and higher investment. Now, what comes uh, additional is the environmental concerns. And you would see people talking about energy transition, and alternative technology as it's the only solution. A uh, solution could be basically reducing the emission of the existing hydrocarbon. That's by itself, if I eliminate the issue that we uh, people talk about and they, we hate and it causes issues, then the, uh, you eliminated all the issues that negative, let's say, that has negative consequences. But there are more concerns about these things. Now, the pictures indicate reality and the other one are challenges. So project manager have to be really, really aware of what to take and consider in their strategies. Now, this is the fourth poll. And uh, have you ever wondered why some digitalization projects or digital transformation projects end up failing? Uh, there are many projects in, in different industries, but why do they fail? Is it lack of unified definition of what really digital transformation is? Lack of management commitment? Short-sighted vision? They're not really aware. It's just like this is the song of the day and everybody is singing. Let's go sing with them. It's digital transformation. Or failing to deliver value. So they implement in things. They haven't seen value. Then they closed it. I mean, it, it might be considered as a failure, a failure but it's a decision just to quit. We don't see value of it.
So it's it's more into the lack of management commitment, and definitely all these causes are real. I mean, uh, but there has to be someone that's uh, that is overriding. And uh, if you look at the experts and what they're saying, people who are really involved, it's many of these projects did not bring, uh, let's say, the value, the expected value from them. Uh, lack of management commitment definitely may 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 result in uh, in let's say deficiencies or slow in implementation or utilization. If they're committed, they will push it. They will continue to support it, and it will end up. Uh, but there is, they are all causes. Uh, but even if you have management commitment and let's say in, in a project that does not bring value, so value has to be assessed. Value has to be presented and uh, and shown to to even management themselves uh, to continue uh, investing on the same technology. Now, important points, and I'm coming to close uh, close to the end here. Roles and responsibilities in any project have to be really defined and clear. Ownership, we stated it several times. Sense of ownership, a mother. In, a, in, in, in any home, they don't have to be reminded to take care of their babies. They just have that sense of ownership and they do care. And in fact, it's natural flow of care. And if the thing, you have sense of ownership about the thing, then I don't have to, no one has to basically push you to take care of. But then you have to have uh, the knowledge that's required to take care is the how. Support and resources, definitely. Continuity is the constructive uh, of cumulative value. Reliability of systems, reliability of engineers, reliability of the whole asset, then looking for improvement in the overall value by looking at the business improvement opportunities. These are more of tips. Now we come to the last basically uh, uh, ingredients, which is strengthening competencies of industry professions. In the old days, when it comes to digital world, basically you see IT and petroleum engineers. There more there is an overlap, but it's not really that much. With today's technologies and introduction of all sorts of technologies, be it uh, mechanical, be it software, be it even systems, you, the overlap is uh, is huge, and in fact. One would think, why not changing even curriculum at, uh, at academia to make sure that these uh, students, when they graduate, they have the two skills uh, or the required skills for today. It's not we are we don't live in yesterday and we live today and they have to see the future and they have to change maybe all the academic uh, curricula to make sure that our uh, kids basically are ready for to face reality. It's not academic. It's real. And, and now, again, when it comes to the value that we shared earlier, we have to have domain experts for informed and predictive and optimized predictive operations. Uh, this requires knowledge, experience, and knowledge experience can be a very reliable database that possesses the knowledge of people. So if you create a database of information that are reliable, even if it's historical, and the petroleum industry is the richest industry of data. So when we talk about analysis, it's not really something new for the uh, uh, petroleum industry. We've been doing it. When you talk about models and uh, twin uh, and the images of uh, basically all of these digital twins and and all of them are basically basics, uh, basic requirement with the, in the petroleum industry. We have simulators, different type of simulators. We have image of the a very complex reservoir, reservoirs. Uh, so that's really not new. Now the new thing is how to expedite things, how to use the technology to make to eliminate uncertainties or increase performance. Now. Definitely, there is no substitute to fundamentals. And, and this is more of a video. And this is the entertainment, the most entertaining part in the, uh, I think, in the uh, webinar here. Uh, there is no replacement for fundamentals. Let's see this video here.
That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is there? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he could fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. Well, uh, the, the example here just illustrates uh, how people could rely on technology. It's, 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 it's brought in a funny uh, style and a video clip, but in reality, uh, there are many people who get stuck with technology and they forget about all the fundamentals. And they, when uh, the Apollo 13, uh, basically uh, team got a, a problem, they uh, it's mentioned that they knew the fundamentals and how to fix them and they did and they came back so fundamentals they will not be a substitution for uh, fundamentals and for the knowledge and experience uh, that stays in the minds of those who are, who we call domain experts and this is why sharing that knowledge uh, to me is more of a gift and the one who is basically gifted uh, is the one who is sharing because uh, the one who is sharing should thank the opportunity for being able to share knowledge. Otherwise, the uh, the knowledge will stay in their mind, and I'm sure the graveyard is the richest uh, place with the great ideas because they were not shared. Now, the last poll, and this is the last slide. What is that you want more to read about or to know about? and the digital world. Vision and strategies. You want to know more about the enablers of, uh, uh, of the digital world, uh, standards and best practices uh, from those who experienced it, who lived it, who, uh, who know exactly what's happening or potential application and business improvement uh, opportunities because they're the uh, the applications is basically extracted from those minds who know the challenges in the industry and where these applications, where these technologies can be applied to produce value. Again, there is no right and, and wrong answer, but there are more emphasis on on maybe one of the aspects because it is uh, perceived as the one that produces or guides uh, industries to produce more value. Now you see here it's more of uh, 34 is the max in standards and best practices as learning from previous basically uh, 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 implementations, uh, vision and strategies that comes second. And let's see what the rest basically uh, of people say and that's a brief. It's about the same. It's about the same. So uh, people maybe perceive they, uh, or at least they're interested in knowing about the same thing. Uh, be it they're focused in digital world or maybe in project management. Again, these are about the the same issues here can be 
uh, considered for any project management uh, uh, and you know uh, project basically uh, it's the same i mean for any project it's vision and strategies enablers even if they're different enablers standard and best practices potential application and buyers and this is why most of the presentations here by uh, advisors they're bringing basically the view of leaders to share their let's say standards best practices we have presentations that are coming to show visions and strategies maybe we need more in the enablers and potential applications as well uh, one last thing to mention here is there are many technological companies uh, technologies uh, technology providers who bring very sophisticated technologies with a great value but they don't have fields and they don't know what value and how it reacts to the environment total environment the one who applies this technology and get access to its performance and the performance of the field has more knowledge about the technology than the inventor of the technology uh, himself or herself uh, and uh, sharing the knowledge uh, with in the petroleum industry is a very conservative uh, basically uh, business and most of the shared knowledge is our success stories uh, we learn from success stories but i think with uh, with the stories that uh, are not yet successful uh, maybe we learn more and by this i think uh, i'm done and i'm ready for uh, the questions Thank you very much, uh, my dear. I really enjoyed it. Extremely rich. Uh, it's like a master class in, in uh, process engineering. We understand a little bit more about upstream. Uh, I, uh, I think much of what you spoke about uh, can be applied to so many different uh, industries or, or practices. Now, now, in addition, we have something, uh, uh, I, I would like to make some more announcements. Uh, uh, this month, we have lots of uh, activities. Uh, there are still two more activities than every Wednesday, which I will announce later on. Nevertheless, uh, there is something called PMO Global Awards. Some of you might be familiar about it. And we are very proud with Badr Burshed. Badr is the leader for the PMOD at Aramco. He is also the uh, president for PMI KSA chapter. Uh, he, he was nominated uh, as the PMO leader for 2020. Uh, he's one of the three finalists. And every uh, nominee is required to have a talk. I had the privilege of interviewing, not interviewing, it's not an interview at all. It was a very, very nice discussion that we, we, we recorded together and it will be uh, broadcasted during the event starts on October 26 until November 16 uh, on October 27 at 11 a.m. Uh, our time uh, which I believe will be dif will differ one hour uh, from Saudi Arabia time and maybe other countries now uh, also I will be uh, uh, speaking at IPMA, uh, Global Best Practice Week, uh, on a topic uh, uh, regarding uh, a, a case about advisors, which is called No Clients, Only Partners. Let me just uh, get us up, okay? It's about how we survived the pandemic, uh, our strategy, no clients, only partners. So uh, this will be live. It's not taped on October 27 at 11 a.m. So very near timing, both of them. Then also there is uh, a taped on November 3. Uh, I will be also be offering with PMO Global Award uh, a case from the agribusiness called Benefit Sustainability, the story of the mighty sugar cane. Very interesting story, full of cartoons. It's about a real program over $1 billion in Africa for the sugar industry and how we did the project management, and program management, actually. Now, the last announcement for today 
let us let me put us somewhere else smaller okay uh antonio uh is progressing in his, on his book with the harvard business review and he finished the, uh, the research about project leadership and found a great correlation with the strategy implementation professional so he's willing to share this is why we added another uh event next week on thursday uh, 15 at 8 a.m., not 9, uh, GMT plus 3. So he will be sharing the result. Of course, I'll be moderating. And I'm very happy that we have with us some newly uh, graduated uh, strategy implementation professionals, Iman Daibel from Bahrain, Olga Valadon from UK, and Mustafa Hafiz Oglo from Turkey. Also, Aisha Bitombo, she's from Congo. Uh, working in Uganda, and she's about to get her SIP soon. So good luck in that. So also, I'd like you to, to join us in, 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 in these activities. Now, having said all this, let us uh, start with our questions. And my first question to you. You spoke about uh, digitalization, and uh, I believe much of what you spoke about, as I said before, could be implemented for almost any industry. The different thing probably would be this, the types of sensors where you get the data. And sensors could be, as you said, could be virtual sensors, okay? And they could be physical sensors. And beyond that, uh, the change we need, the mentality, the leadership, the best practices, the follow-up, uh, uh, the going over, over, over phases, the the maturity, okay, until you you achieve the 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 optimization, and before the optimization, until you are successful in risk management, which is beautiful because uh, I always advise uh, uh, organizations and people that risk management is so powerful, but you will not benefit from it in, in day zero. To benefit from risk management, you have to have accumulated data and validated the data and understood the data, turn them into, into knowledge, which is the step below, which gets you to, to have a, a, a forecast a little bit nearer to what could really happen, and this makes a, a big difference. Now, my question to you is about the technical aspect. In Lebanon, we are said to have huge amounts of oil and gas. And it did not start yet for many reasons, which could be a good thing. Is there a type of sensor or gauge, whatever, that prevents oil and gas from coming up as long as there are thieves in power? <laughs> yeah, I, I, there is a sensor. Okay, please get, get us 10,000 of these. Mu'az Gharbi, is there a difference between digitalization and digital transformation? Well, the, the digitalization world is not really uh, very old. And, and people used to use digitization. And it's basically converting the data from you know, paper and, uh, into the digital format. Then digitalization is more of equivalent, that's my opinion, to digital transformation. And it's not an in, uh, incident, it's a journey. So if you ask someone, uh, do you have a digital transformation uh, strategy? And where are you at the journey? Because it's, it's continuous. Things keep changing within the... Uh, the uh, that domain by itself technologies change maybe workflows and fundamentals really don't change and this is why i emphasize on that video fundamentals are really important because they don't really change uh, or they rarely change i don't think they change anyway um, if they're based on uh, on facts yeah. now technology change workflows might change uh and uh, the uh, the culture can change their perception about the same thing. Even us, we have changed our views on certain things that they're the same thing. Now, 
If you think about Uber, for example, and this is the example you will be you'll be hearing about digital transformation in all uh, the presentations and most of the presentation. This is this uh, company was born digital. This is first uh, thing to think about. So it's easy to implement the things that already exist. So they have internet. It's a technology that exists. Taxis are there. Our owners of cars are there. Could we do the same model using the old technologies, just like I have a phone and operator with multiple uh, operators within uh, an office uh, to call these uh, individuals who are hired by us or maybe work for us, just phone calls? Yes, we can. Now, they capitalize on uh, the existing technologies and platform. They created their own software that uses GPS, uh, database, and a program to serve, uh, to give a service to customers. So they're customer centric. They looked at the customer and how to satisfy customer, but they have used everything that exists. They did not come up with anything other than application. Then it's right. the promotion type. They promoted the, the things and they, they were successful in the promotion and the easiness of the application itself. But the basis right. and fundamentals of all the things they, they, they built is, it's available to everyone. And now with COVID, you see the schools turn to be virtual schools. Mm. All the applications are available. And in fact, they could have uh, switched into a virtual long ago. But again, uh, it's timing, but all the technology exists. I mean, they haven't come up with anything uh, if, you, if you look at it. Now, Nabil Farhat Talib is asking, can you tell us about the risk of digitalization or digitization on options, command, and control? Well, it depends on the industry. Now, if you go to medical and if you go to uh, the petroleum industry, I'll, I'll leave them, but I'll go back first to something that he is already command and control. They're using an uh, autopilot. Do you know how, how, how long... A flight from, you know, you know, a flight from, let's say, Lebanon to the, the States, you know how, how much time it's an autopilot. Mm -hmm. Is it a, a command and control? Is it? It is a command and control and it knows direction. It, mm -hmm. it, it takes it and I'm, I'm commanding it. It has the direction and it goes to whatever, even landing in critical conditions, sometime can be taken over by uh, an auto. And this is what they're thinking, at least. And it's been implemented now. Again, fundamentals, if you look at the uh, at one of the movie by, uh, I mean, they, it, he landed basically the airplane on, on a river. I forgot mm, what the sorry. name is, but yes. Sorry. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's Tom Hank. And uh, it's, it's basically, uh, and it's the jury and the uh, judges were all against him. Then he, he was the expert and he took charge of it and everyone was safe because he knew the fundamentals and he took a decision with the risk that's associated with it. So there isn't something that's free of risk, but sometimes confidence is so high that you make that decision. Now, you talked about data and that can be translated into knowledge, but I'm telling you data and knowledge is nothing if you don't translate it into an action that produces value. It's the data in the database. So what? It's very valuable if it is only used, just like our ideas in the mines. I told you, the graveyard is the richest place of great you know, ideas. They were not I used and <laughs> shared. The famous saying, a fool with a tool is a fool. <laughs> okay. He, now, he, he might be an agile fool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's a very dangerous one. Yeah, exactly. Now, Munir Jude is asking, as per uh, latest McKinsey survey, it uh -huh. shows that sectors like oil and gas and construction are always the least in adopting the digital tools and platforms. How can we move the, those sectors forward to be at least uh, in the Middle East to be a little bit ahead? And here, before you answer, I'd like to say one thing because I know. Uh, I've, I've been, I mean, I know lots of people from Aramco for the past 10, 15, 20 years. Aramco is, is a unique uh, case. So whatever Aramco is doing in so many cases, better than 
many of the of the international organizations, even in the states and and elsewhere. Now, take Aramco aside; it's a, it's it's a different story. And I believe we have our friend with us, Imad Lemhaisen. He's the technical uh, chairman for the GDA Gulf Downstream Association, and, and he knows about this more more than I do. So, uh, what do you think now? No, answering. Let's go. And I did not answer the command in the oil and gas, and uh, oh, so okay. I have to elaborate on that one. But it's okay. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll come back to this. Now, okay. the command and control when it comes to the oil and gas and uh, the risk averse, they're very secure, uh, and, and the medical industry. Now, when it comes to command and control, with 5G and all the instrumentation that's available, Theoretically, an operation in your body, in everybody's body, even to transplant, to change kidney, can be done remotely if you have all the tools. Mm. Now we go to people. The expert is elsewhere, and now the technology, be it uh, telepresence and all the controls, they can, they can operate. I mean, theoretically, they can do it. Would you agree to, to do it or not? Now, when it comes to the oil and gas, it's, it's a uh, competitive business. Uh, one incident can jeopardize uh, a company. It might just fail or lose business, just like the Mekundo or, you know, in the Gulf, and not Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico. So one incident could jeopardize the whole thing. This is why they take extra care. It's not, it's, it's, it is a necessity, in fact, to make sure that operations are, you know, uh, are secure. Plus, people are involved. So, souls, you don't want to lose souls. You make sure that the environment is, uh, is safe. And with all of these precautions, and uh, it's not command and control, uh, mishaps happen. It's not sometimes it's a human mistake. It could be a failure in technology. It could be a natural cause, but uh, uh, are we going to be there in certain, uh, in certain optimization? I think yes, uh, especially uh, in automation. Uh, um, uh, the experience we've gone through, let's say, uh, advanced uh, automating systems, just like uh, artificial lift and, and pumps, they can be automated. Uh, in fact, and the control is on site with no human intervention. So there could be. Uh, but no, you go to satellite, transferring data through satellite or not, it, then it's security and, and, and other issues to discuss. Now, when it comes to the oil industry, they are very conservative uh, on digital transformation. Uh, well, they're the first ones, the first industry to have the same enablers implemented since the beginning. They use technologies, they have their own workflows. They are the richest industry in terms of information, and they, they are the richest users of it, even before the introduction of AI and uh, the word or the term of digital transformation. Every single reservoir you would see uh, uh, basically uh, a digital image of it using a numerical simulator, just like an and even the infrastructure, the piping infrastructure, you will see Olga or other, uh, you know, flow assurance tool to make sure that it is, you know, uh, calibrated and matched, even for every single well. So was it really today? No, it's, uh, well, since I started with, the, with, let's say, working in the petroleum industry, I, we were constructing well models. No, the only change, again, it's Uber-like taxis. It's the same surface, but in, in a faster way. We have applications. We have faster computing power. We have algorithms that we can use to optimize certain things and, 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 and things. Uh, now, it, 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 what comes to the oil industry, it's um, very influenced by the oil price, uh, by catastrophes, let's say, and these things. Now, you go to certain companies that focus on, let's say, security, you will see them investing in security more than anything else, just to make sure everything is secure, including data. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to optimize to make sure that I produce more, or let's say international oil operator, you see their focus on production and producing more. They will bring the technology that 
serves them in, and to meet their objectives because it's an objective uh, to them and maybe overriding objective. So they invest their, their objective. They have strategies definitely and they implement it conservatively uh, to meet their objective at the minimum, I think, investment. Why should you go full blast? I'm not a technology company to go, let's say, petroleum engineering. It's not a technology company. They use fit for uh, tip one, one of the tips, fit for purpose technologies. So do we go full-fledged digital transformation? Then uh, it's extremely expensive and pro- uh, the cost is prohibited. Then they go very selective in strategic locations to get the maximum value of these uh, technologies. Uh, wherever they sit, they sit it in a well, uh, a subsurface, extremely expensive. I sit it at surface and I can create a virtual sensor subsurface using the models that are physical and proven to be right mm-hmm. or close to be, you know, uh, very reliable. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it depends on the strategy and objectives. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, let's try to move quicker. One minute per question because I have 10 questions. Sure. And they are, they are all interesting. Now, uh, from Gary Kraschel, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank are you. we suggesting that transformation is a natural evolution and cannot be forced upon people and organizations? Well, forcing it is, is, is not really a, a way of it. And definitely any transformation and any uh, transformation to using technologies or new business models, uh, it's, it's not an incidence. So it has to be really gradual. And my, uh, my philosophy in these things, start small with a big vision, mm. more with a big vision. So people, and be successful. Mm. Start small, big, big vision, then uh, uh, be quick in expanding. So expand quick, start small, expand quick, have a big vision. And that's basically a strategy that I would see very successful in most of the organization because you will gain power, you will gain fame, you will gain value in every, uh, every step that you uh, execute and implement and, and just be quick in it if you have uh, the vision that's clear and the investment uh, is right and you have the finance to, uh, to, to continue. Again, okay. the tips, all the tips, continuity and uh, sense of ownership, get those people to start in the first steps. Just like normally any change management process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, Karen Bronman, uh, she's our ambassador from Slovakia. And uh, how far can satellite data help in exploration of oil or gas fields? Can satellite data help managing energy flows, usage, etc.? Well, their claims. Uh, about exploration and uh, some Russian companies claim that they can basically do exploration using satellite images, uh, mm. maybe studying existing uh, structures and uh, uh, analogies, and that's analogous to basically others. Uh, I haven't myself experienced, uh, I've read articles, I haven't seen any implementation. And when it comes to flow, I don't think it's, 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 uh, it can be measuring flow, maybe leaks, if we have uh, high resolution and focused images to certain uh, facilities or incident, incidences uh, of leaks and, and other things, of estimate of flow, if you have enough data. Leaks, mm. uh, I would say maybe yes. Or if they have sensors of temperature and then they can estimate the change of temperature and they have to come up with algorithms to uh, translate them into flow rates. That's more of uh, thinking out loud. Now, the other question also by Karen, which is interesting. What about digitalization of project management itself? Well, definitely there are components within project management. We say the finance and uh, logistics and others uh, they, if you have established, if you establish a database that's really accurate, visible by all the stakeholders, and then you set your uh, roles and responsibilities with uh, a structured workflow that's already exists, so you know it. 
you can digitalize every single workflow with roles and responsibilities and give gives time frame now if it is a construction uh, project you can even associate with it the drones to create an a twin uh, to it basically a digital twin to the site so you could go and fly these drones come back and they will basically tell you what the uh, progress today and tomorrow if there is a case issue so you program them in a way they bring you more of a report what's the uh, what's happening today then there are other applications with digital uh, for projects that are really specific but mostly related to workflows and execution I actually Salah Din asked about the uh, how do you see the contribution of concept of digital twin and digital transformation and I think you just answered that well but, but by the way I answered this earlier when I said every single reservoir subsurface has a digital twin hundred years ago so this concept is not really for the petroleum industry is very old concept every single well every single reservoir every single facilities has a digital twin it's almost a necessity for uh, big companies all companies i would assume have digital twins big companies uh, they have digital twin of their facilities and subsurface uh, environment they do mm. Now, a question from your dear friend, Imad Lamhaisen. He's saying, dear Saeed, should technologies or business value creation drive for digital transformation? I would say business value. I go for business value. Technology uh, brings value, but it's the least. So uh, you have a secret driver and uh, uh, you can use it. In, uh, you know, it's fit for purpose anyway, technologies. You have to use it and apply it and know where it's applied for. It's, it has to be fit for purpose, fit for purpose, it has to bring value. And you have to know, understand their, their limitations because they are not really, there is no magic stick. Again, fundamentals are really, really essential because with no fundamentals, you will not use them the, the best way. I totally agree with respect to the technology. It might be a constraint in what, in what sense? Uh, one of our uh, uh, advisors, Dr. Kibbe, he did his, his research PhD in Japan. And when he went there, uh, their research was, I think, 15 years ahead of their technology. Meaning, some concepts will have to wait until the technology is mature enough to test whether or not they, they can be concluded. Uh, but, but this is maybe not the case else in, in so many other uh, places. No, seriously, uh, we face similar issues uh, where ah. some concepts uh, were brought, maybe a premature birth, <laughs> premature birth, then basically uh, people who have no vision or at least lack uh, mm -hmm. flexibility and maybe understanding, or maybe they're stuck to the current environment. So this is the norm and the comfort zone. Don't change anything. Uh, mm. and don't change anything if it's not broken. So mm. they, want, they would like to continue doing whatever they, they're doing the same way and uh, using the same tools. And I know someone who came up with a very uh, innovative thing and it was considered more of a waste of time. Mm. Uh, five years later, uh, he brought mm. the same thing to someone who was visionary. What a fantastic tool. <laughs> so it's the same thing with no change. With no, ch it's the same thing, and it's five years uh, old with no changes. Uh, it was brought five years later. What a fantastic tool! So yes, they were not, they were, they were not ready here for it, or politics changed. Yeah, there are many, many, many fa factors. Okay, now uh, Khaldun al Rawashda is asking: Can we assume technology as an asset? It is an asset. At least it's uh, one of the, uh, if you bring it yourself, then it's uh, definitely started with an, an intellectual asset. It's yours. Then whatever application you use it for by itself is an asset. Um, mm -hmm. It could be intellectual, it doesn't have. Because sometimes technologies is bring for a certain thing. You discover its capabilities that are beyond what the technology mm -hmm. providers perceive. Sometimes, I mean, it's not always. They, they are expert in their technologies and they know how it functions. But the application in the field uh, is, is a bit different. Mm -hmm. 
Now I have a question from Subhasan. I'm curious as to where do you position safety, sustainability, and environment in the framework of digitalization for upstream? Well, uh, definitely it's a concern uh, for all organizations and uh, safety, uh, you will see uh, designs in every single organization and when it comes to the oil and gas, safety first. So for fields that, let's say, consist of H2S and uh, other gases, you will see sensors all over, sirens and, and uh, not only this, this is the technological part, but what's associated with it, it's an educational program for the employees and in fact for whoever is a potential uh, uh, you know hazard this uh, let's say in a residential area they bring even programs to educate them it's not only the, the sensors and the technologies uh, for sustainability uh, it depends on sustainable again act locally if it's a well they want to sustain production of a well they will use different technologies uh, uh, for every single field, because fields are not really the same, uh, be it gas, oil, different oil, heavy oil, uh, light, and, and others. Uh, and all of them would like to sustain the capability of a production. And it's getting money, by the way. So they want to sustain income. Okay. Uh, Muhammad Shaban. From your point of view, what is the advantages and potential disadvantages of digital transformation? I believe you listed lots of the advantages, but I would like to hear a couple of disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is clearly shown in the last video. So that's one of the disadvantages. Uh, but to, to basically plan for it and be ready for it, we start with a stronger base of uh, the education. Uh, and, and definitely, uh, I've been suggesting to certain academic centers to modify their curriculum to ensure that they, the engineers, when they graduate, they're ready to work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just like wood experience. So it's fine to, to have breaks within the academic, basically, program for them to go to certain fields where we see potential, uh, you know, uh, need in the future. Again, it's, it has to be a holistic program for a country and in fact, or for an industry. Uh, if it is a country, it's easier. Uh, if they have control over the academy and the uh, industries uh, for the whole world, then basically all the whole world leaders have to and collaborate. So again, we talk about the same model, but it's for uh, countries then. Uh, it's leadership. You, you're, uh, you're, you're touching on something very dear to me because we developed uh, project management postgraduate diploma with the American University of Beirut and run it for five years with amazing impact. Then we developed another one with Schema Business School. Uh, and the whole idea is about bringing practical knowledge from experts to people in order to bridge the way uh, towards better careers and better organizations, what organizations need. That's really fantastic. I mean, seriously, because universities or at least conventional academic centers will teach you how, uh, you know, theoretically how to fish. <laughs> but maybe a fisherman will, will really teach you how to catch fish, real fish. It's not theoretical, man. It's a practical thing. Exactly. So, exactly. And if, if, if you look at the new guidelines or at least the new uh, uh, concept of uh, assessing people based on their qualification, not degrees. But academically, you will learn the philosophy of how the fish would feel. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe then you don't catch no fish. <laughs> Because it, it, it must be, you know, it must be hurting the fish if you're uh, empathetic enough. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going to finish the last question with Karen again. And she's saying the reality is often that organizations want to go back to normal instead of moving forward to a new normal after COVID-19. Well, uh, that's a new normal. Uh, but uh, definitely, it's, it's not the first time that we go through crisis. And maybe uh, she is young, 
and maybe this is the first episode of a crisis that he uh, uh, and I hope it's it's the last. But anyway, and uh, long life for her. But when it comes to you, for instance, you went through several crises within Lebanon, and things go back to normal. Uh, maybe a different normal, uh, different mindset. You still have memories of it, and you become stronger. I mean, that's in the positive side. Now, are we impacted? Yes. I, myself, I caught COVID myself, and uh, I suffered myself, but I'm I'm healthy. I'm okay, and I alhamdulillah, uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, alhamdulillah. And then I I know people who are close who passed away, but it's a natural process. Again, uh, we don't like it. We hate to see people who we know leave, but this is basically an ultimate thing that's going to happen to everyone for a, a reason or another. Uh, so COVID is a, is really global, and that's the uh, the unique thing about it. Uh, it's really global, and uh, everybody is suffering. And in fact. We think, I think basically it should be seen as uh, a global uniter rather than a, a global more of a catastrophic thing that's uh, destroying everyone. We are united and I see you now, uh, I see everyone. I hope I, I could have you know, seen them do, uh, through this presentation, but definitely we're communicating. Uh, we're, it's not like the norm, but this is a new norm. It's, are we gonna go back? Maybe. Actually, if it was not for the corona, then we would have reverted to, to what we have been doing in the past period, which is doing lots and lots of conferences, physical conferences and, and congresses, where, where we meet and shake hands okay, and, and dine, dine together. Uh, it has its merits, and I, I, lo I love to go back to that state, okay? maybe not shaking uh, hands too much. Uh, nevertheless... Uh, the boundaries that were opened, the people that we connected with, okay, when I started this project, normally I thought about the Middle East and North Africa because this is where we operate. I was extremely happy uh, that we penetrated all of Africa and Latin America. And we have people attending uh, our webinars from these locations. This is richness, okay? This is unforeseen benefit, not planned benefit. And I don't see it happening if we kept on doing a seminar in uh, Khobar or Dubai or by normal cases and, and, and so on. You reminded so, me of one thing. Uh, yeah. An article that I wrote, it's part of, it's one chapter of in my book. It's called Borderless, Borderless. So, uh, and the article is a few years ago. Yeah, yeah it's a it's few years old. And I'm talking about the borders that is, we are, we live in a borderless world now. And this is the concept, basically. I mean, we share the same concerns. Uh, we exchange ideas. It's a borderless world. And in fact, borders physical borders are man-made. So we're eliminating them. Uh, you could see everyone here from Africa, from Asia, from America, from Far East, and we just eliminated borders. And this is the beauty of the thing. Go to borderless world. Uh, but hopefully we have this mindset in, uh, over here, uh, there should be no border because uh, people uh, country is earth now, now uh, uh, two more notes because Karen she's saying one of the fake news and hate speech in social media big part of, of th these we call disbenefits okay and they require us to have more critical thinking be more aware okay uh, much more than, than before I'll tell you for example my, my kids I have trust and I never watched what they do. But when I spent more time, I found uh, one of my kids uh, playing games in an environment that, uh, international environment that, that promotes drugs and, and other things without him knowing or understanding what they are saying. So this got me to raise my firewall, okay? You cannot stop 
the digitalization or the digitization or the technology, you cannot tell him or her don't use it, but we can start by, by learning how to survive with it, okay, with, with its this, this, this benefits. And last thing from Imad, uh, he's talking about also something important that we've seen many initiatives, including digital solutions for years, have not continued but failed or ceased. What would guarantee or secure taking digital transformation into full implementation and benefit realization? Well, uh, uh, the questions in the petroleum industry, uh, full uh, utilization or full digitalization. Uh, it has to be clear first with the definition of digitalization itself. Then full, what do you mean by full? For instance, uh, certain companies uh, consider 30% of their equipment or wells or assets uh, are instrumented. They have uh, real-time connectivity and uh, processing of data is, is okay. And that's basically a strategic uh, initiative that uh, that is basically has uh, management commitment and the funds and all of these things. Now, let me serve him in one thing to for him to appreciate the strategic thing of it. You go to a hospital, you don't see the whole hospital digitalized, but definitely the ICU is the most critical place and you will see all the instrumentation and equipment. And in fact, even the staff themselves are more expert than the other ones. And for one reason, these are critical places and strategically I made it and I invested in it to have it basically ready just in case somebody needs that attention or that care. Fit for have, purpose. It's a fit for purpose with all the technologies that you need and the competencies. Mm -hmm. Again, the three ingredients that we indicated. So the organization, the processes, the technologies and the competencies, they're all together in one unit could be five bits it could be 100 bit but definitely the hospital cannot be all fully digitalized unless you have all the competencies all the technologies are cheap enough to be installed so it's it's multi faucets uh, and it requires more of a strategic again it's a holistic thing it's a, it it involves all industries uh, and the whole world to, to have everything digitalized. Security, for instance, countries will spend in security. That's more of strategic. And in fact, if even a small street, they would like to monitor what's happening, then you will see cameras in it and sensors. Uh, so what's the drive? And what's the purpose? If it is really critical, you will see that big investment in it. Uh, but again, of course, and definitely, it's a fit for purpose. I mean, uh, we go back to fit for again the first tips. Said, uh, thank you very much. This has been one of the longest. Uh, <laughs> we are all, almost two hours. <laughs> okay, uh, but I, I really, really enjoyed the, the discussions, the, the the insights, and definitely, uh, um, I'm happy because I have a front seat to attend each one of these uh, webinars. And by doing that, I'm learning uh, a lot. So thank you very much for My remaining pleasure. with us, for your uh, generous uh, uh, sharing of knowledge and, and, and insights and input. Uh, looking forward to collaborating with you again soon, uh, inshallah, and yeah. wish you to stay safe. Would like to say anything to our audience remaining 108, 106? Well, 106 is, uh, are, you know, I, I hope I gave you at least a few tips, uh, that much of information. And by the way, all I, I gave you all I know. <laughs> I did not hide anything. And uh, definitely I'm looking forward to give you more aspects of uh, that are related to the petroleum industry. But definitely, if you think about them, and even the ones that I brought to you today, they're related to every single project or uh, industry. Thank you very much for attending and uh, you take care of yourself and really stay safe. Thank you. I wish all our 
our participants to remain safe and we'll looking forward to seeing you next Wednesday and Thursday. So bye-bye. End it tonight. Okay. Assalamu alaikum.